example, we are going to deal with our leadership tonight. Are we good? Are we good with leadership? Okay, beloved, that is our leadership. And tonight, let me just record on this machine. Good evening, beloved family and friends. Tonight, it is um, my privilege to, to just come and let's talk about the characteristics of leadership. It is one of the topics that it appears that people shy away from. It appears that people don't want to to talk about what are the characteristics of leadership. It is, it is to me, it is so interesting that people just want to go ahead and be leaders without understanding uh, what leadership is all about. Now, for for just to 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 get our our creative and our thinking uh, being exposed and, and and start running quickly, let us be creative in our thinking. Everyone here in 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 our room here is a leader. Uh, in some area of your life, you at your workplace, you might be in a position of leadership. So, so everybody here uh, is is a leader in some area of their lives. So, so, so uh, questions. There are certain questions that we need to ask ourselves. Uh, if I can just stop quickly and ask everybody, uh, if they join, they must make sure that they are muted because we are already recording. So, so they must be in a mute mode when they join, join so that we don't get uh, interferences in recording. And I know when you're not muted that the, 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 the sound comes through very uh, broken and people cannot just hear what 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 he said clearly so the questions that we must ask ourselves when we when we look at uh entering into leadership uh number one how do i lead uh which whose example do i follow when i lead uh, is, is there certain principles is there certain things that we must follow when we lead uh who do i want to please do i want to please god or do i want to please men Am, am I trustworthy? Uh, that is that is one characteristic that we need to, am I trustworthy to be trusted with the people of God? So we need to implement, and these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves when we uh, aspire or we desire to become leaders in the ministry. And I'm not just talking about our ministry here. I'm talking in any leadership form, in, in at your workplace, uh, at, at at community level, whatever. I'm talking about being a good leader. Okay. What does Proverbs 29:25 say? Proverbs 29:25 says, "The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever puts his trust in Jehovah shall be safe." The fear of man, who, who do we want to please? Is the fear of man or, or, or so, so, so uh, important that, that, that I would rather fall into, into some trap or fall into some disciplines that are contrary to God's word just to please man? It is rather, it is rather that I put my my my, my trust in Jehovah, in my put my trust in God, that I that I please God rather than please men, and that is uh, the context that we must look at. Who do I want to please? Do I want to please God or do I want to please men? And characteristics of leadership. What what? What, what kind of characteristics are they? Are we leading like Jesus? Are we leading like Jesus? First Peter 5 verse 3. It, it, it starts from verse 2, but verse 3 says, Nor is lording it over those allotted to you by God, but becoming examples to the flock. We, 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 we must not lord over people without reflecting the example of Jesus. We must lead like Jesus. We want to lord over people in telling people they must do as we say, but we are not following an example for them to reflect to. This is, this is the pitfall of the whole thing. We want to lord over people. We want to tell people what to do, how to do it, when to do it, as if they are, they 
they, they hear it from God. I'm, 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 I'm not saying we, we're not talking through the power of the Holy Spirit in what God says we must say, but people start looking at us instead of looking at God. That is very dangerous. We must lead like Jesus led. And we will see there are examples that we will follow that, 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 that in the very next one, Jesus said, learn of me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, "Take my yoke on you and learn of me. <laughs> Take my yoke on you and learn of me. Learn, be, let me be the example for you. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest to your souls." So, 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 so we must learn of Jesus according to Matthew. And when we lead like him, we must learn of him. We cannot learn from somebody else. We cannot portray somebody else. There is no other example but the example that Jesus sets for us. What is another good characteristic of leadership? The knowledge of the word of God. So many times we want to be leaders, but we don't understand and we don't study the word of God. And the knowledge of the word of God gives us such a big problem. Let us read Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. For indeed, because of the time, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be teachers. In order, you, you know, let me just stop there. In order for somebody to be a teacher, this, this person needs to be knowledgeable about the subject. So if we need to be teachers of God's word, we need to have knowledge of God's word. You have need that one teach. Let me read it again. You have need, it's a continuation of verse 12. You have need that one teach you again what are the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have become in need of milk and not of solid food. What it says is, for indeed because of the time you have need to that one teach you again. What, uh, 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 it is the teacher has to come and teach the student again. That implicates that people have become in need of milk. And, and Paul already said we need to step off milk and we need to get onto solid food. For everyone partaking, verse 13, for everyone partaking of milk is, uns, is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. If we don't need uh, know the word, we don't have knowledge of the word, we are being called according to the word of God in verse uh, Hebrews chapter 5, 13, unskilled in the word of righteousness. We are like infants if we don't know the word. Verse 14 says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, grown up. You are an adult, so that solid food is beneficial to you. Even those who because of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. When the solid food comes and we are adults, we grown up, we matured in our Christian walk, we have knowledge of the word, that is when we have solid foods, that we can get to the point and, 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 and exercise, our senses is exercised in such manner to discern both good and evil. So we need to make that decision. And therefore, if we have knowledge of the word, we can lead God's people into righteousness. Is that okay? We are getting there. The, 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 the next characteristic that we that we need to look at, beloved, is, is, is the characteristic that speaks to the fact that we must have the courage to challenge error. We must not allow error to continue because it can become a big thing. Is, is there somebody that wanted to say something, beloved? Okay, so so the, the characteristic is to have the courage. Okay, I need to be unmuted. All right, okay. So we can continue. Uh, sorry, Bishop. The one that's that's the video you need to you you can leave that. The one with the Bible you must always keep unmuted. Sorry for confusing that. But let's carry on, beloved. So as we say, we need to have we need to have uh, uh, ourselves in 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 such manner that we can have the courage to challenge error. 
Matthew 15, verse 10 to 14. And it reads as follows. Matthew 15, verse 10 to 14, it reads as follows. Verse 10, and he called the crowd and said to them, hear and understand. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. <laughs> Let us listen carefully. <laughs> let, let me just stop there. Beloved, if we, if we join, if we can please join in the muted form so that we don't bring disturbances. Um, okay, I'm going to start again with Matthew chapter 15, 10 to 14. Matthew chapter verse 10 reads and it says, And he called the crowd and said to them, Hear and understand. Not that which goes in to the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, thus defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant when which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up let them alone they are blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind both shall fall into the ditch interesting jesus had the courage to challenge the error he had the courage to speak up against those that were offended by his saying Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth. That is the thing that defiles a man. And then people got to took offense about that saying. And Jesus said, <laughs> every plant which my father has not planted shall be rooted up. So Jesus challenged the error. As leaders, we need to have the courage to challenge the error and not allow it to, to remain. That is very much important for us to understand that we need to challenge the error. Let us just do some, 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 some introspection and, and, and we can say uh, what are the definitions of, of certain um, uh, leadership terms. The elder. Beloved, in the Old, Test Old Testament, the, the elder was a person entitled to the necessary respect and reverence. The elder in the Old Testament, we can read all about, they say the elders were sitting in the gate, the elders were called when decisions for the, for the community had to be taken. It was, every case was taken to the elders. And therefore there was great reverence and respect for the elders in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, this responsibility now came to pastors, bishops, overseers, leaders, rulers. So, 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 so when we when we look at it, the elder then uh, had the function. We, you see, the calling may be the elder, but the function may be pastor, bishop, overseer. He may be the assembly leader. He may be whoever leader in the community. And, and then it is, it is somebody that rules, takes decisions for people uh, to, to, to have a, a resolution or solutions to their, to, their, to their necessary problems that they bring to the elders. So, so, so it is, it is, it is interesting that we, that we, that we need to understand the elder, the definition of the elder was, the elders were highly regarded. They were, they were, they were reverenced and respected very high in the community, according to the Old Testament. The bishop, beloved, the bishop is synonymous with the elder. As the elder was overseeing spiritual matters, as the elders were overseeing uh, community matters in a spiritual sense, they would then look at the, 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 the justice within the communities. So the bishop is the same as an overseer, similar or synonymous with the elders. What does 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4 say about that? 1 Peter 5, I exhort the elders who are among you. I being also an elder. This is the writer, Paul. Uh, Peter, I being also an elder 
and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 2 says, feed the flock of God among you, taking the oversight, not by compulsion, but willingly, nor for base gain, but readily. What does base gain mean? For self gain, for gain of myself, to be, to exalt myself. Not as lording it over those allotted to you by God, but becoming examples to the flock. Again, it is emphasized that we should not lord over people. People must not bow down every time they see me. People must not jump when they see me because I am the Lord. I am not. I must be an example to them so that they can follow the example to get to God. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a never fading crown of glory. So, so, so we must be good overseers. We must. Uh, uh, not lord over people without the example of Jesus. We must lead by example. Because when, when Jesus comes, the chief shepherd comes, we will be rewarded. We will receive a never fading crown of glory. And so we'll find it in 1 Peter 2.25. I'll just read it quickly for you were a sheep going astray, but now you are turned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. If you have your notebooks, write down Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. There's Ephesians 4.11 and 12. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. You see, beloved, sometimes we think that the deacons is just a lowly position. Sometimes we associate deacons with hard work. It may be so. But the deacons were part of the, the congregation or they were the people in the congregation that were part of the governing body of the church at the time, together with the overseers. And the overseers in this case were the elders. Okay. So let us understand the definitions in not taking it that the one is higher than the other. There's, according to the Bible, elders and deacons. But the rest, the pastor, the bishop, the overseer, the prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, they are all synonymous with the elder. Their functions may be different, but their calling should be synonymous with the calling of the elder and the, 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 the position of the elder within the community or within the, the congregation to be respected and to be reverenced. Okay. That is just the definition that we can that can bring clarity. Let us look at what leadership is. What is leadership? If we didn't know that, it is not brainwashing. It is not hypnotism. Leadership is in fact influence. Anytime you and I are in a position to influence somebody's thinking, somebody's behavior, or the development of people to accomplish a goal, you are in a leadership role. The moment you are in a position to influence, you are in a leadership role. If you can encourage people to give their best, you are in a leadership role. If you bring your team uh, in, in such manner that your team can, 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 can excel and, and reach goals and, 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 and they can, and they can uh, 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 just uh, be the best they ever can, then you are in leadership. You are in a leadership role. Now that we come back to the question, how will we as leaders lead? What is leadership and how will we lead? And what, th this is an important one, what is our motivation to lead? What, what is our motivation to lead? Let us just go and see what we can see. Our motivation of leadership. Let us, let us concentrate on that one just for a while. Just for a while. If our motivation is self-serving, beloved. Now let us explain what self-serving is. There's a couple of points that I've put down. If our motivation is self-serving, if we use that influence that we just spoke about, if we use that influence to fulfill our personal ambitions, 
my personal goal, building my kingdom, living in the best areas with the biggest house, driving the best car, wearing the most expensive clothes, to be honored by everyone, to, to be bowed down and, and people must just jump when they see me because I am the man. Beloved, that's to be self-serving. When we have in the self-serving mode or motivation of our leadership, if we have an ego, it actually means it we edges God out. We are moving God out and we want to be seen and we never see God. That is what our ego represents when we are, our motivation is self-serving. We have, when we are self-serving so leaders, we have this thing called pride. And what does pride do? Pride seeks to please men that they will speak well of us. Ha, let's just look quickly at Matthew 23, verse 5 to 7. Matthew 23, verse 5 to 7. But they do all their works in order to be seen by men. <laughs> they make their, their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they love the first couch at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Huh? They want to sit in front and greetings in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi, rabbi by men. Well, that, that is pride. I don't want to come in. You know, I mean, in, in, in many ministries that I come and I'm being invited to come and preach, I, I my wife always says, then you there, you are so early there, you opening the church doors, but I'm the guest speaker. And then I would slip in, say good morning to the to, 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 to the people that are attending to the to the pre-service uh, disciplines, and then I would sit in the back and just sit quietly. Don't tell them who I am or anything. And then I sit quietly. And then when the pastor comes normally in a in a rush because he's late or whatever, the pastor comes and he and he sees me first, walks in and do some things, and then he sees me right at the back. And then he says, no, pastor, come forward. You can't sit at the back. Then everybody that's been around us, me and my wife, for, 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 for a good half, half an hour before service starts or even 45 minutes, then they jump. Oh, are you the pastor? You can't sit at the back. You must sit in front. But if I had pride in me, I would walk in and say, I am pastor. I'm preaching at your church today and I need to sit. Where is my seat uh, where I need to? Where can I park my car? My, uh, it seems my car will be will be uh, broken into if it stands there. Uh, what's this about? So you want to be seen of men. And that is not how it should be. So what is our motivation as a leader? Okay, let's see. If our motivation is to, to, is to be of service and dedication to Christ, this is what will happen. We will model and encourage godliness. <laughs> we will not use our influence to fulfill our personal ambitions. We will model and encourage godliness. And then we get back to our ego. Now that we're in service and dedication to Christ, our motivation is correct. What does the ego do? The ego exalts God only. <laughs> so, and what does pride now do? Pride is kicked out the door because humility. Now we see humility. Humility exalts God. What does Romans 12, 1 say? Okay, it's one, two, three, but let's read quickly. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect for by the grace given to me i say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think this is where it comes but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that god is assigned don't anyone among you not to think of himself more highly than you ought to think humility 
true worship exalts God as well. When we worship God in spirit and in truth, we exalting God. There's no pride. Pride is kicked out the door because we worship and we exalt God. Look for verse eight. And Jesus answered him, it is written. Ah, we need to be careful that we understand the word of God, that we know the word of God, because Jesus says it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you worship. Our true worship must exalt God. Must not be for our own personal gain. It must not be to, to be seen by men. We must model godliness, beloved, when we, our motivation must be correct if we want to enter into leadership in, in the church of God. Next point on motive, or correct motivation. We must develop and maintain respect and trust. Respect from other people, beloved, comes through our honesty, our integrity, our truthfulness, comes through wise counseling and all those niceties that we find in the Bible that describes a good servant, a, the, the, the fruits of the spirit. We need to reflect, we need to, 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 to live that in order to be good leaders. That must be our motivation for good leaders. Beloved, one thing we need to understand, this is, this is the thing we need to understand. Love and respect are not automatic, they are earned. We think that as we step into, into leadership, people must just uh, love us and people must just respect us. It has to be earned, beloved. Even before you step into leadership, people must respect you and people must have a love for you. What does First Timothy teach us? First Timothy 3 verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. He must be well thought. When people thought good things about you, it means they respect you. If people uh, love you, it is because they, when they speak good things about you, they also love you. But you must be careful not to fall into disgrace or being or fall into the snare of the devil let us let us put it plain let us put it plain don't let it go to your head don't let your leadership position go to your head don't let when people love and respect you don't think that people must serve you no 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 let don't let it get to your head we must know trust is developed over time but can be quickly lost and is difficult to restore. Huh? That is, that is a strong statement. You see, people, you work hard on your integrity. You work hard on your honesty, your truthfulness. You, you seek wise counsel. You give wise counsel. And, and you work hard for this trust to be developed. And it takes time, beloved. But you can lose it just like that. By one action, one dishonest action, one action of low integrity, of no integrity, one action of lies, one action of deceit, you lost the trust. And believe you me, forever how, for, for how long it took you to develop this trust, it might even take the rest of your life before you can get to that point again. So let us be careful as we develop and maintain respect and trust that we remain honest, we remain a person of integrity, we remain truthful, and we must seek wise counsel and give wise counsel. Because love and respect doesn't come automatic, beloved. Let us just, as leaders, be the people that can be trusted and the love will come automatically. Characteristics of biblical leadership. Yo, this is a difficult one. We must ask ourselves, what did Jesus do? Now, if we don't know the word, we cannot 
even answer that question. What did Jesus do? And we need to go and look at the three and a half years that Jesus um, had his ministry. And, and there we can get all those answers. But we need to understand, beloved, first of all, leadership is influence. What did Jesus do with his influence that he has? He called the 12. Great influence. He had, he had this presence uh, about him that, that people did not argue. He, had, he could change people's minds. He could encourage people just by talking to them. He had great influence. But he was also somebody that serves. Leadership, beloved, is serving. It's not lording. It's serving. It is not getting there and then people must carry you on a silver plate. It is getting there and moving the chairs around. It is getting there, taking the broom and sweeping the hall. It is getting there and, 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 and asking somebody, can I bring you some water? It is not the fact that when people does that, Many a times when, when, when we, we, we had ministry, me and my wife, we were busy uh, planting, and then people would look for the pastor. But then this person couldn't understand why is the pastor packing chairs? Wow, who's, who's that packing chairs? That's the pastor of the church. Does that make me less a person? No. It gains the respect of people that this one don't just want to be served. This one is prepared to serve. What does John 12, 26 say? 12, 26 says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Leaders, we must be servants. Where, where God is, where Jesus is, there we as servants must be also. We must remain in his presence. We must have our ear close to his mouth. We must uh, 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 act according to the word. And if we serve, if anyone serves God or Jesus, he must follow Jesus. Matthew 25, 40 and 45, not 42, 45, this verse 40 and verse 45. And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. What it's, what it's saying, it's saying is you have served the least. You have served the lowly. You have served the one staying on the streets. You have served the one that lives in poverty. As you have served them, you actually did it to me. So you were indirectly by serving those you were actually serving God. Leaders, we must be servants. Verse 45, then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So how can I say, I, I serve God, but I don't want to serve my brother. I serve God, uh, but, but I don't see the need of my brother and serve him in his need. We need to be servant leaders, and that's the importance of it. Beloved, to be leaders is to be teachers. Leadership is teaching. What am I saying? Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them hmm? seeing the crowd he went up on the mountain and when he sat down his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them leaders make sure that those that are with them are being taught are being empowered that is the the, the politically correct word is leaders must make sure that those that follow him and share responsibilities with him or her, or her, sorry, uh, beloved, to be politically correct, that follow him or her is empowered to do the same, to go and teach. John 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants. 
for the servant does not know what his master is doing but i have called you friends you see to be a friend of god is such a great honor for all that i have heard from my father i have made known to you all this 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 the secrets that jesus heard from his father he gave to his friends he will never give it to his servants because that's why i don't call you servants anymore because the servant doesn't know what the master do but my friend my friend will be invited to my house my friend will share with me a, a meal at my, at, my, at my house. But the servant must be the one serving me and my friend. And they don't know the whole story. Beloved, we as leaders must exercise that teaching mentality to empower people. They always say, and this is a saying that I love, it says, a good leader or a good manager works himself out of a job. When you start feeling obsolete, then you've done a good job because you have empowered people that can fulfill their task with such excellence that you feel obsolete, you feel not needed, but you've done a good job. There are two key, ele key elements, beloved, of leading like Jesus. Two key elements, it's forgiveness. How do we react to mistakes of others? <clears throat> How do you and I react to the mistakes of others? Let's go to the Bible. You know, the Bible has get, got all the answers that we need. The Bible is there. And whatever we need, we'll find it in the Bible. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. How do I react to mistakes of others? Do I forgive them? I want forgiveness for my mistakes. But I cannot give forgiveness. But that is true. If you haven't got forgiveness, you cannot give forgiveness. You cannot give something that you don't have. So you need to get forgiveness in order to give forgiveness. And that is the way to react to the mistakes of others. Let us not be the judges. Judgment becometh God and not us. Let us not have a judgmental uh, mentality. But let us, I always say this, and, I, and I, 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 I maintain, I always see the good in people until they prove me wrong. As leaders, let us not judge. Let us love and forgive before we take that stance, because God has not given me that authority and responsibility to judge. We must display grace. We must not be harsh, beloved. We must not be in a sense that saying, I told you so, and I don't want to hear nothing and, and, and be harsh on people. You don't listen to what I teach. I stand up there at the pulpit week after week and nobody reacts. Nobody says amen. Nobody applies the word. Let us not be harsh, but let us have compassion. Let us have this, this, this heart of stone removed and be replaced with a heart of flesh. Let us have compassion. Let us display grace. The same grace that God has given to us, let us give it to other people. If I want to enjoy my grace, I need to give grace. And my grace will be always topped up and filled up as long as I keep giving. I must have compassion. I must be compassionate as a leader. I must always seek to enhance the well being of others. Galatians. 6 verse 1 and 2 brothers if anyone is caught in any transgression you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted you see that's harsh but the bible says let us look at it from a spiritual point of view and restore him with a gentleness 
of the spirit but we must be careful that we are not also tempted to fall in the same snare of the devil verse 2 says bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ simple we need to be compassionate bear my brother's burden be my brother's keeper colossians 4 verse 6 says let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person <laughs> sometimes we, the answers that we give drives people away from us the answers that we give without thinking you open your mouth and you put your foot in it ah aina we need to know how we ought to answer each person i i i always wonder about certain words now the bible says how to answer each person that tells me that you need to have different answers for different people don't treat everybody the same as a leader certain people you will have the talkative people you will have the quiet people you will have the submissive people you will have the resistant people you will have different people that you have to deal with but you need to have the grace and the compassion to speak to each people, person differently. You've just dealt with a resistive person and now the next person that come in is actually so quiet and, and submissive and then you have the same attitude. You're going to hurt that person. So let us be careful. Let us read Colossians 4, 6 again and, and, and look into what it says. Second Peter 3.18 but grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ let us grow in that grace and that knowledge to him be the glory both now and the day of eternity so that is speaking about our lord jesus christ but we must grow in the grace and the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ the grace and the knowledge the grace and the knowledge how to deal with situations how to deal with person people on each on their own merit so these two elements are important for us to keep us on our toes as leaders forgiveness and grace freely we receive freely we must give with so much compassion that we that we don't miss the boat grace and knowledge What, how, how, do, how does life reflect on leaders and leadership? Especially for us, where people look up to us. How, how is our attitude towards life and towards others? We had Colossians now, but can we look a bit deeper? What, how? should our attitude be towards life and towards others number one love your neighbor as yourself love your neighbor as yourself but let us reflect that is the words of jesus when when the rich young men come and and he ask him what's the greatest commandment what does first peter 3 10 and 11 say for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. <laughs> if, if I love my neighbor as myself, I will, not, I will not speak evil against myself. And I will not speak deceit. I will not try. It is dangerous to deceive yourself. So what is the first thing? Love your neighbor as yourself. So you wouldn't do to your neighbor what you wouldn't want to have done to you. That is how the explanation. What does verse 11 say? Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Ah, we are ordered to seek peace. We must turn away from evil. How, how come these things be spoken to, to leaders? Yes, we have, we, 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 unfortunately, we have leaders that practice evil. 
in their actions and in the way they speak to other people, in their love to their neighbor. Your neighbor is not the guy staying next door to you. Your neighbor is the one that you have communion with and fellowship with every day. Your neighbor may be staying 10 streets away from you. Your neighbor is the one that you pass in the street. It's not just the guy staying next door. So it's important that we turn from evil and do good. That is, that reflects on our attitude for life because then we show that we love our neighbor as ourselves. What else can we use that can reflect on our life as leaders? We need to have good character. We need to exercise faith. We must have disciplined behavior. We must have a reputation. Beloved, we need to have a reputation. And all these things must be reflected in our leadership style. It must be reflected in us as leaders. Good character, exercise faith, disciplined behavior, and a good reputation. Now there is 1 Timothy 3. It's, it's all from verse 1 to verse 7. 1 Timothy 3 from verse 1 to verse 7. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So we know that whole story. We can read it and we can understand it. So we need to have good character. We need to exercise faith. We need to have good behavior, disciplined behavior, and a good reputation. It speaks of that. And but Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for, for this is the whole duty of men. If we have a good character, excellent faith, good behavior, disciplined behavior, good reputation, that is, we then fear God reverently and we keep his commandments. And that is our purpose and our whole duty as leaders. That is that, beloved. Ha! Interesting. A servant leader. This is this is matters that we that we need to look at. I can tell you now I've got from this tile or this slide, I have just another seven more, but it goes quick. Don't worry. We still have time to talk after this. A servant leader. You, you and I can ask ourselves, am I a servant leader or a self-serving leader? We now know the difference. We dealt with it. Am I a servant leader or a self-serving leader? In which category do I fall? Self-serving leaders consider their own interests first above all others. Self-serving leaders will look to, 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 as I said earlier, to get the first seat or the best seat. Self-serving leaders doesn't care if those that their that, 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 that followers are, are, are having a meal to eat. I'm just worried about making donations uh, for my cupboards to be filled, for my child to be at the best schools. That is self-serving leaders. They don't encourage you to have your children going to the best schools and private schools. They want your money to send their children there. Ah, Aina. That's the truth. Servant leaders consider others first. If I'm a servant leader, I would love my brother's child to, to, to excel in school so that they become the lawyers and the do doctors and the accountants and, 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 and maybe who knows in our uh, services we must have, we might have uh, in our congregations, we might have the, 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 the next prime minister, the next president, uh, whatever. But we must be servant leaders and consider others before our own interest. We must make sure that everybody in church have something to eat. We might even find ourselves, you have nothing, but everybody else is eating. I'm not saying that's the correct way. I'm not saying that's, that's the only way, but that shows that we are servant leaders. We lead from the front. A shepherd, I'm going to say this again. In biblical times, the shepherd was walking in front of the sheep making sure that they are protected, making sure that he takes them to good grazing field, making sure that he leads them to water, to places of water. 
But nowadays, and I saw it in South Africa, nowadays we find ourselves that the shepherd is walking behind the sheep. The sheep must protect the shepherd now. Hmm? The sheep must take the brand. The sheep must find their own grazing fields. The sheep must find their own water. And the shepherd walks behind him. And the sheep finds it, he takes it. Bring me water. Bring me grazing field. Oh, did you see the devil coming in? You must pray. But the leader doesn't pray. Beloved, we need to get our priorities right as leaders. As a servant leader, you consider others first before your own interest. Lead from the front. Be an example. And just to throw this in, I love this. When, when I met Pastor Eugene, Bishop Eugene, the very first time, he said a, 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 a wise thing. He says, shepherds don't make sheep. Sheep make sheep. Not shepherds make sheep. It is, it is, it's not right. Sheep make sheep. Therefore, you will always see, and even on my background there, you will always see you are invited. So we need to invite people. We need to get people onto this platform. We need to let people hear about the good news. <laughs> As leaders, we must encourage those that follow us to invite, to invite, to invite. Okay, they're not following us. They're following Jesus, but they're following the shepherd that Jesus appointed. We are not lording over our people or God's people. We are not lording over them. We are shepherds to them. We are servants to them. And our interest must be secondary to other people's interest. Beloved, Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And we can see that throughout his ministry. He came to serve. What can I do for you? Jesus, son of David, what can I do for you that I can see? So Jesus came to serve, not to be served. A servant leadership is remembering who we serve. We must never forget who we serve. We must never try to take the place of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must never do that thing and let people look at us instead of looking at our Savior. Beloved, as leaders, we need to remember who we serve. We must have faith working with love. We, 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 that, that is such an interesting statement. We, we cannot have faith without love. I cannot believe in somebody when the person that I lead, I have faith in, but I don't love the person. I, I always say it is a reflection of yourself if you don't trust the people that you appoint. The question then is, did you go in fasting and praying before the Lord before you appoint somebody? Because now that the person is appointed, you find fault with everything that the person does. You don't trust the person. You micromanage the responsibilities. Did we lose the love? So what happens with our faith? I had faith that this person can do it. And now I doubt it. Is it because my, I have no love for the person anymore? So we need, our servant leadership is connected. Our faith is connected with love. According to the word of God, beloved, and it is not human opinion and traditions. We must lead according to the word of God. We must do things that we can find and, and, and substantiate through the word of God and not through my own opinion or what tradition teaches me. Those are the dangerous parts, the human opinion and tradition. Those are the things that can bury you as a leader. Rather, be somebody that stands firm and go to the word of God. And there it says it, according to firmly established biblical values and disciplines and criteria. According to that, that is what the leadership is. That is the, the type of leadership that we must have. Firm established, firmly established biblical values. 
and we must have the example of Jesus Christ. We must have him as our example and we must live that example. We must re always reflect that example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this all because we remember who we serve. Very important. What does servant leadership requires, beloved? What, what, what does it require? We just said that servant leadership is firmly established and maintained biblical values. But it requires also a visionary role. You must, you must, you see, each and every ministry and each and every church has got a vision. Now, if you don't share in that vision, why are you there? If you don't share the vision, then you bring division. If there's no unity in the vision, then you bring division. What does Proverbs 29, 18 says? Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. People cast off restraint. That is bringing division. They don't have the respect, the reverence for the leadership. But we need to have a visionary role. And if that doesn't happen, everybody does what they want. Without a clear vision, there is confusion. Yes? If the vision is not there, then there is confusion. Our vision and mission statement says to reach and enrich the world with God's limitless love. If we don't follow that, if we don't exercise that, if we don't implement that, then what are we doing here? We are bringing division. So when people leave, and this is speaking from maturity, when people leave, I always congratulate and bless them because I trust that they would do what I would do. I would go before the Lord, even in my workplace. I would go before the Lord. I would ask the Lord and I would wait for an answer before I do anything. So when you come to me, I, I assume and accept that you've laid before the Lord in prayer and asked, fasting and praying, asked and you got an answer and your answer is that you need to move on. Who am I to doubt that you as a mature Christian did not do that? I'm not going to do that. So you don't need to stay if you don't share in the vision because the vision is clear and there should not be any confusion. You see, the statement that, that, that I made, the status quo must change when it is not working. The way we do things now, if it is not working, it must change. It, it requires of the leader to stand up boldly and say, the status quo is not working and we need to change. Bottom line. Beloved, the leadership, our leadership, we as leaders, it is required of us to have, to exercise a willingness to implement the vision. You, you need to serve, you need to, it is, it is a service that you must uh, render and implement that vision. It also requires us to be patient, to be persistent, and we must have, okay, let me put it, we must have persistent positive teaching. We must not be the one day up and the next day we down and you and you doubt the vision and you doubt the implementation. The, all your planning is going down the drain because this day you're now negative. There is no positivity and you don't teach anything positive. And you become impatient and now you become negative. As leaders, it is required of us to be patient, to have persistent positive teachings so that people can be always there and understanding because you are teaching this positivity. You are teaching people to hold on even if it takes a bit longer. In God's timing, it is the perfect time. So you need to teach people that principle, God is always on time. Never early, never late, always on time. 
Beloved, as leaders, we've got the pastoral authority. Now here it comes. We thought the pastor was the one to be served. But a pastoral authority is like a shepherd authority. We need to understand that Christ is the head of the church, not me, the pastor, the bishop. Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5.23 reads, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, the head of his body, and is himself its savior. Right? Christ is the head of the church, is the head of the body of Christ, and he himself is the savior of that body of that church. The shepherd does not beat the sheep, nor she to the sheep, but the shepherd. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> the shepherd does not go around with a whoop and beat. We said we must have grace. We must have forgiveness. We must have love. And, and now we don't need to go and beat up people. And then people should not headbutt the shepherd because he's not looking at the time that you headbutt him. We need to have that authority to treat the sheep with the greatest respect, with the greatest humility. We need to serve. Because of that action, the sheep will never but the shepherd because they know who the shepherd is and they know who they are when it comes to who's the head of the church and the head of that ministry. Who will be chief is to be the servant. Let us find our answer for that in Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28. It's a long part. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. <laughs> whoever wants to be the chief must be the servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Huh? You need to be, you did not, you don't want to be served, you want to serve. That is the authority that's been given to you, or that's required of you. Mark 9.35 says, And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone will be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. If you want to be first, you must be last. If we as leaders lead from the front, we will be the first to be a church, and we will be the last to leave. Ah, but we can appoint deacons to do this and deacons to do that. You will be the first and the last to leave. What is the very first sentence in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1? It says, in the beginning, God. So when things started in the beginning, before everything else, God was there. And that is the example we need to, be, to follow. Even before the musicians arrive, you will be there. Before the deacon is there to move the chairs, you as a leader, you will be there because in the beginning, God. And then you make sure that everybody is sorted before you leave. The house of God is in preparation and ready for the next service before you leave, even if you have to join the deacons. Today in life, we find the leader of the church comes in just to preach. He's not there for the worship. He comes in to preach. And once he's preached, he goes out the back door and you don't see him after service. That is the mentality. Now you tell me if that is a servant heart. You don't even know if all your sheep are today in service. You just come, you preach, you go. What kind of a leader's heart is that? So we need to be able to serve to be served. We must serve first. We must be first. We must be the ones leading from the front. I cannot tell people to be on time at church when I'm late. 
I cannot pay myself and Bishop when it comes to 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 prayer meetings to services. We already talking from uh, half past seven, eight o'clock on a Sunday, uh, seven o'clock. I get up here. I start making my makeshift studio ready because when Bishop comes in at half past and say room is open, then we test and make sure that everything is right. And still the devil tries to derail us by by, by making the te technology not work when we need it to work it sometimes. But what I'm saying is that I cannot come in and everybody's there and say, people, just wait for me to set up quickly. I must be there. And when people come, they come and enjoy because the fact is I want to serve. I'm a servant. I'm not a leader that don't serve. Same thing, community or church leaders. We must speak the truth in love. People can pick up when we are not truthful. People can pick up when we when we don't love in communities when we go in there and we want to serve them and we want to give them food and we want to do things for them. They can pick it up if you do it for your own gain or you do it with love. When somebody walks uh, into the community and he uh, opens up his car's boot and he takes out bread and he takes out soup and the next thing he takes out is his camera or even before he takes out the soup and the bread, it's his camera or video camera or cell phone and he starts f uh, video recording and he starts taking pictures um, of his car with the food in it. People think, is this for us or is it? for those that must see it. So people already knows that maybe you're doing this because you need to report back for the money that you get for this. So is this for us or is it for you? So we must be truthful and we must be in a mode of love. We must have the courage, beloved, to stand for the truth at all times with goodwill and tolerance. As church leaders, Church leaders in the community will be respected highly if they can stand for the truth at all times. Serving the community like we serve God in spirit and in truth and not with deceit. And if we can go out there into the community and reach out to them, because the, 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 the Bible states go into all the world Preach the good news. Baptize them. That is, we need to go out and find them. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 15, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. I don't need to read the whole thing. We all know it. We can go and read it ourselves. But we, we as leaders were given the gift of, of, of uh, the apostolic gift, the prophetic gift, the evangelistic gift, the gift of caring, the pastoral gift. And we, 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 we were given the gift of teachers. But we know all of these are actually the function or the call as an elder. We were just given those gifts to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So we need to teach people. In Matthew 5, 38 to 48, we need to go the extra mile. With, we, we know the Bible says in 38, it says, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other. Yeah, that's another discussion. We need to look at it spiritually. And everyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So go the extra mile. He slaps you, you give him the other cheek. Well, not physically. You just go the extra mile. He takes your, your tunic, you give him the cloak as well because the pair. You said, oh, you need the other one as well. Take it. Then you have a complete set. Go the extra mile. Be patient. Be tolerant and have a goodwill, but stand for truth at all times. Beloved, let us conclude. 
the fruit of great servant leadership is achieved when the leader provides the next generation with the wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual resources to serve their generation. Can I read that statement again? The fruit of great servant leadership is achieved when the leader provides the next generation with the wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual resources to serve their generation. We know David has been said that he served his generation well. God knew Abram would do the, just that. Genesis 18, 19. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abram what he has promised him. Abram did it to his children and his household. God knew that. God knew that Abram would do just that. And this is what Jesus did in John 17 verse 7. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Now people can know what comes from God. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. The fruit of great servant leadership is achieved when the leader provides the next generation with the wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual resources to serve their generation. Jesus did just that. Whatever God told him to say, he said it. And people received it. And they have come to know the truth of what Jesus said. And they believed that Jesus was sent by God. So. Who am I as a leader not to empower the next generation? I said earlier, when I empower the next generation, I work myself out of a job. And that is good. It's not bad. Beloved, leadership is never about power and control. You don't want to control nobody. God doesn't even control people. They, everybody's got a free will. You are not forced to serve God. You have a free will. You can decide to serve God. Leadership is inspiring, beloved, not dominating others. You must inspire people to greater heights. You must motivate people. Leadership is inspiring. Leadership is about helping people to achieve the faith and vision of Christ in their souls, knowing his love, forgiveness, and grace. Evangelism. You need to help people to achieve the faith and vision of Christ in their souls. You need to, you need to be that servant to walk the extra mile. And one of the greatest gifts leaders can give others, beloved, is hope. We cannot give faith and love that they need to have by themselves, but we can give them hope through Christ Jesus. That is the only thing. Faith and love, they need to exercise and have for themselves. Finally, beloved, finally, leadership is or leadership ought to be serving in joy. We must have the joy of the Lord when we serve others because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We must have as leaders, we must serve by caring and sharing. Serving is fulfilling and unselfish, beloved, not self-serving. You, you, you need to be unselfish, and it must be fulfilling to serve others. Beloved, leadership is serving that glorifies God. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Beloved, that concludes. That concludes our, our, our evening for tonight. And I trust that we've learned something about leadership. We as leaders are servants. We are not to lord over people. We are not to, 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 to let people 
uh, we don't need to dominate people. We must care for people. We must love people. And, and, and we must give God all the glory and the honor through being able to serve and have servant hearts. May God bless you, beloved. May you experience his grace, his mercy. And may you know that it is only through the grace of God that we are able to serve and be of good, how can I put it? Uh, we can be a good example to people through the grace of God. God bless you, beloved. Thank you for attending tonight. Now we can have